thing you would do to go around. Probably the first thing to do would be to go around and do some introductions and if we have some new board members possibly and, and I don't know if you have new committee members, but it's always good to do some new introductions. So we'll start on this side. If you're all right with that, work our way around the table. Sounds good. Larry Blaisdell. So this will be my second year as a member of the Welcome. And I'm Matt St. John. I have the newest member of the school board. I'm Greg Cook, uh, chair of the board. Uh, this is finishing up my eighth year on the board. I'm Patty Brown, the business administrator. I'm John Goodrich on the budget committee for uh, oh, Glutton for Punishment, second year in a row. <laughs> uh, he has served the budget committee and this is his uh, fourth year. Bill Clues, budget committee. This is my first year. It's going well. <laughs> I'm Diane Penance. Um, I'm the chair of the budget committee. Don Kiet, first chair on the budget committee. Mike Stevens, budget committee. And Steve Kelly. Steve Kelly, budget committee. And then you've got uh, Dr. Hart, our superintendent, I believe, on the call. I don't know if she's sees picture anymore. But... Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> And I think uh, we've got a couple of members of our community in the, in the room as well. Uh, so uh, moving on, Dr. Hart, do you want to present the, uh, the, goal, the goal alignment of the school board and uh, school administrator as uh, number three on the agenda? Okay, so um, yeah. So basically what I want to try to do that this evening is is um, for any new board members or or um, uh, both on the uh, school board or the budget committee. Last year we we tried to to um, get together um, and, and and try to be a little bit more collaborative than maybe we had in the past. And and this first meeting is is designed to try to do that. Um, I'm going to go through a. Kind of the context of of where we are as an administrative team in developing the the budget um the objective of tonight is to to um to have you go through where we are at this point and then get some feedback on either questions that you have or or concerns about what you're hearing from us or some suggestions on on how we can move forward so so my suggestion here is, is I'll go through this presentation and, and then um, we could open up for some clarifying questions and then just say, okay, you know, as board members, what do you see? What does it make you think? And what are you wondering about? Or what type of feedback do you have? Um, and then I'll bring that back to the administrative team, um, the feedback that, that you do give us and, you know, uh, make any type of modifications um, in in the budget uh, to try to reflect that feedback. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, I can't hear anybody, but I'm going to assume that it does. <laughs> uh, all right. I think it's how are we doing on this presentation. Um, if we could move it to the to the next slide. You know, I think when, when we're talking about anything um, around the schools, it's critically important to come back to what the school system sees as its mission, vision, and guiding principles. And so I'd like everybody um, to take a moment to, to reread some of what we say is central to what we're, we're doing. Because, you know, budget and financially, um, it's, you know, we, we want to be aligning how we spend our money um, on what we say is most important to us. So I'm just going to uh, give people about 30 seconds to, to review what our, our mission, vision, and guiding principles are.
Okay, great, thank you. Um, if we can move to the next slide. So the school board you know, has goals uh, every year, the three goals that we're gonna be focusing on for this year and most likely moving into next um, is what you see, uh, build a positive collaborative professional culture across the district, provide an elementary school building that addresses the current and future needs of elementary students and staff and build a K through 12 curriculum based system to develop students as 21st century learners. So hopefully um, you'll see this more as we get more deeply into um, the, the, the budget process um, and how uh, hopefully those three goals are embedded in, in, in how we're leveraging um, our funding to, to uh, support those goals. So if we move on to the next slide, one of the things that the school district has been doing for a number of years now is focusing on three, what we call the big three. Um, and that's, if, if we look at, at it, I'm gonna start with the middle piece, the competency-based education. It's, it's really being clear about what you want students to know and be able to do. Um, that's a little bit different from um, how many of us went to school where there was always a bell curve um, where you just kind of expected some students were gonna do exceptionally well, some students were gonna do moderately well, and some students just weren't gonna cut the grade. Um, Competency-based education shifts that whole paradigm and philosophy. It's all about being clear about what you want students to know and be able to do. And the expectation is that all students will, will reach those, um, uh, those high standards. Doesn't mean that other students may not go beyond that, um, but the basic competencies um, uh, we want all students to, to do. So I'm gonna then move over to the right social emotional learning. I think we all know that students, um, if they're not socially and emotionally stable and secure and um, empowered, then they can engage no matter how bright they are, how, how gifted, um, uh, they might be intellectually, uh, uh, you know, it, they're not going to engage in the learning experience. So we want to make sure that um, social emotional learning is central to all of our curriculum. So we're, we're, we're creating a culture where students feel supported, feel um, uh, that they're involved with, etc. So, and then the final piece, I'm going to move all the way to the left now, is uh, universal design for learning. And that's basically saying <clears throat> that instead of in the past, teachers would come into a classroom and, and they'd say, okay, this is how I run my classroom. And you know, if that worked for you, that was great. If it didn't, um, that was a challenge for individual students. Universal design for learning is it's saying just the opposite. It's, it's saying that we need to know uh, what, each student in our class needs to access a rigorous curriculum. And so then we have to adjust our teaching and learning, our assessment practices, et cetera, to make sure that they can engage in that. So when you put these big three together, it's a pretty powerful combination. You see that manifested in, in the type of curriculum that, that we purchase or develop, the type of professional development that we do, um, the, the type of of classroom and evaluation system that we have for teachers. So going on to the next slide. So, so what are we doing about that now, um, this year into next and probably the next several years? Um, well, one of the things we're doing is uh, if you look at the bottom right part of this slide, we have um, a book called Making Thinking Visible. It's uh, just one moment, please. Um, so what we what we've done is is with we're taking two different books that the whole um, school system is reading. The, the the school board members have copies um, of them. All administrative teams team has all of our teachers and our paraprofessionals. And so the first book, which isn't identified here, is um, Creating a Culture of Thinking. And that's, that's about what has to happen 
systemically within our culture to support thinking. Um, and so that's one piece that we're doing. The second piece is the, the, the book that you can see there, Making Thinking Visible, is a very tangible way for teachers to change their teaching um, and learning in their classrooms to, um, uh, to support um, and make thinking visible in their classrooms. Some of the things that we did to try to uh, support that this year is we had, I think about 45 staff members that included administrators and teachers attended an online conference um, hosted by Harvard University called the Sparks Conference. And the Sparks Conference kind of helped launch this idea of how do we change or modify our learning culture to have it focused on developing students' thinking skills. Um, now to do that, that's kind of a challenging shift in our teaching and learning. So we've, we've tried to go and build some systemic collaboration meetings. If you looked at um, all of our meetings as an administrative team, they're all focused on this goal of, of uh, building a culture of thinking. Um, we have, we spent every, every year, we have four days before school starts um, to get prepared for the year. And three out of those four days, um, we had an agenda that helped build people's understanding and capacity around this focus on, on, on thinking and thinking development of students. Um, we also have had in the last first six weeks of school, we've had 24 teachers uh, participate in professional collaboration training. So um, that helps build the capacity to, to collaborate with each other as teachers, especially um, around your work, because this is it's a difficult shift. If you, if you try to shift your classroom environment to a, a greater focus on thinking, that means you have to change some of your practices. And that, that's, um, that's always can be a little bit challenging. So if we can build a professionally collaborative um, culture where people are sharing both their successes and their challenges, um, that builds a system that supports innovative change, not only for this particular innovative change, but innovative change over time. Um, and the final piece there is deepening our uh, professional culture by expanding teacher leadership. So, um, so we want to have, we want to build and expand um, uh, our teacher leaders. And those people will have specific training on how to um, uh, facilitate uh, collaborative con conversations with their peers, how to go through what they call an inquiry cycle, um, where you, you take a look at what you want to achieve, gather data around that, do a, what they call a gap analysis, and then research um, best practices to help close that gap. And so we want to build that um, so it's embedded in our regular culture. Great. So, that's kind, of, that's kind of, you know, in a broad sense, where our focus uh, is this year and will continue to be next year. So when we look at our budget, what's the current budget context, um, in my opinion? Well, as we all know, um, uh, we lost uh, state aid um, just recently. We, we brought that to the voters and, and the voters decided to, to, to keep that funding. Just for the budget committee, I think it's important that the budget committee understands that adequacy aid comes from the state um, and why Littleton has a fair amount of adequacy aid is because when they look at that formula that includes our demographics, our student demographics, they believe that it's, it's challenging uh, for us to support the students with some of the social, um, uh, uh, the Social economic challenges that um, they ha they have. One of the biggest key issues is free and reduced lunch. Well, free and reduced lunch in, in Littleton is some fluctuates between forty and fifty percent. That's a huge amount of students that, according to the the federal government and state government, are living in poverty. So so, 
in my opinion, this current context is that loss of state aid um, is concerning to me because I don't feel like people understand why that state aid comes to uh, Littleton. The other piece that I think is, is a challenge is um, uh, in New Hampshire and uh, nationally, at least currently, we have in excess of 5% in, uh, inflation rate. So we need to try to do business next year um, uh, in a positive way with that type of challenge um, around you know, the inflation and how much things cost. The final piece is negotiations. So I think uh, um, obviously the school board knows and the budget committee, if you don't know, um, we have to negotiate with uh, both of our unions, our support staff union, our teachers union. So um, that's going to have an impact um, on our budget. Now, I just want to build that context, um, but let's go on to, to what, where we are right now. So. So as you know, the federal, what they call ESSA funds is that, that stimulus um, money that has been sent out to, to school systems and towns across the nation. What we're doing as we built this budget um, is we're saying whenever we can, we want to take especially long-term projects around facilities and get them funded through ESSA. So, um, you know, with a, we have some roofing that we, we can do. There's, um, you know, there's just a number of different facilities issues that have been on our facility strategic plan for a number of years that we're hoping ESSA funds um, will help us do. That's important for us because that allows us um, to take a look at our operations budget. Um, the second piece is technology. ESSA funds are very supportive of technology. And we've made a huge commitment to technology in Littleton in a very positive way, but it's an expensive um, piece. And so, um, but if we can get the, if we can leverage the ESSER funds to help with technology, uh, that will help not only for the next couple of years, but we're hoping it will go um, three or four years out. Um, and then finally, um, teaching and learning. That, that we can make some modifications um, and, and change some support systems for especially our most needy students and use ESSA funds to do that. So, so um, these are funds that we're, we're hoping will we'll take in these three key areas and be able to have a positive um, budget impact for a number of years. ESSA funds, um, we're supposed to have them identified and spent by 2024 but we're hoping we can extend that out beyond that. And, and we can talk about that a little bit more um, later in the presentation. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so what have, have been my budget objectives in collaboration with uh, my leadership team? Well, one is that we have a level funded budget. Um, and so, and, and I think at this point anyway, we're, we're in pretty good shape um, for that. But I need the budget, especially the budget committee. Um, <coughs> I need your help as we move forward. Not only are we looking at level funding, but with um, a 5% uh, um, inflation rate, that's essentially somewhere between an 800 and a million dollar cut. Um, so I think the, 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 the town people need to, to understand that, um, that level funding, it's like, well, we gave you the same amount as we gave you last year. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that everything's more expensive. And in the, in the current economic conditions, it's fairly substantially more ex, uh, expensive. So that was one budget uh, objective, is to, to be able to present to the school board and eventually to the community, a level funded budget. The, um, the second piece is, as I mentioned before, to leverage ESSER funds. So that helps us right size our operations budget. It helps us right size our technology budget and allows us to support teaching and learning in ways that we may not have been able to do without it. Um, 
And the final piece is, is we are woefully um, uh, behind in trying to recruit and retain support staff, like our paraprofessionals. Um, I think at the bottom of, the, if we hired somebody right off the street now, I think it was just over $11 an hour. Um, people, um, you know, people make a lot more than that working at McDonald's. Um, and it's very similar for our custodians. So we have to do something to, to stay competitive so we can recruit and retain people. So that's been part of, um, you know, part of this budget. Now, having said all of that, we still expect that what we'll present to the community with the support of the school board is a level funded budget. Okay, let's move on. So the warrants, I just figured I'd, I'd throw some stuff out there so, so we could be start thinking about it. The safety items that weren't accepted um, uh, in our adequacy aid proposal, I think we need to take a look at those safety items and maybe a couple of other pieces. I think that, you know, what we're doing here, and I hope especially the, the budget committee sees it, is we're trying to right size uh, elements of our, our budget. Um, but what that means is if you do that, you have far less wiggle room. I, you know, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but um, the far less wiggle room. To be able to retain instead of two and a half percent, um, five percent, to ensure that, that if we're really you know, tightening the belt in other areas that if we get into trouble, you know, we won't be in a situation where, you know, you'd have to go back to the taxpayer or, or um, et cetera. And there's been talk uh, for the time that I've been here and you can see as you walk around the classes, some of our classroom furniture, none of that's embedded in our budget. Um, but, um, you know, I'm thinking that maybe we should um, bring that uh, to the product community and see if they'll support the one-time spending around some of our classroom furniture needs. So this is just a you know at the at the point of you know just I have three different questions you know what do you see um, what does it make you think and what are you wondering about what type of feedback do you have um, this is going to be a little bit difficult because um, I'm not going to be able to hear. It's, it's a little garbled. So I don't know if there's maybe through Craig, if the question could be repeated, if there's specific questions for me. Um, and then I have uh, up at the front of the room, uh, um, Sheena is gonna be, you know, if there's, if there's questions, if there's any concerns, if there's feedback, you know, if, if we could record that, so then we could bring that back and see what type of modifications we need to make in our budget before we, we send it out to first the, the school board and, and then later the budget committee. I don't know if anybody has any clarifying questions before we go in, into um, any of the, the other pieces. Bill, Steve Kelly, can you hear me? Bill? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the one, well, one thing that kind of caught my attention, and obviously very valid point, having to do with the hiring support staff, the uh, summer program that we had three summers ago, uh, evaluating our school system performance in, in all aspects, uh, probably the number one finding in that summer, and this was comparing our school system with seven, seven other comparable school systems in the state of Hampshire, was that our pay structure and benefit structure for support staff was out of skew, if you would, with the seven other uh, schools that we were aligned with in the state. And the main finding that we came out with, out of that the summer session with, was that we needed to increase our pay scale for our uh, support staff, and we needed to adjust our uh, benefit package downward. Uh, our benefit pay, the sense was that a lot of the people that we had working for us and that were interested in those jobs were, were looking for the benefit package and not for the, the wage uh, offering. Um, that same year, uh, the school was engaged in a contract negotiation uh, with that support staff and basically 
that main recommendation, I think, was not addressed at all and wasn't addressed successfully. And I, I to throw this on to Tom Mangles, uh, who was involved in it. We came back with the answer and we asked him, well, Tom, what happened to the recommendation? And basically, he said, uh, the people, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, people weren't interested in it. But that probably weren't interested in it because the people that you already had worked for you had come to work for you because they were more interested in the benefit package than they were in the wage package. So uh, that, that is something that I think we all recognize, but uh, if you compare what we're offering as a benefit package, if you would compare with that to seven comparable schools, uh, we were significantly higher in that. And, uh, and obviously, we were just, and that too, be not just for the benefit package for the support staff, but we we're also significantly higher than the rest of the school in terms of our regular teacher contract. So that's something that certainly has been visited, and I think it has the support of the committee and the community in terms of making a change, but somebody needs to initiate the change. Right, Sheena, let, let's, let's try to capture that. Um... Uh, on our flip chart. I think so, one of the challenges is since we're actively in communication with those two unions, there's only so much we can talk about, right? Because the, 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 the substance of the negotiations has to remain confidential while they're ongoing. So we've officially opened up negotiations with both the, the LSSA and the LTA. So it makes it a little bit complicated for Ann and I to speak eventually to this. Right. Yeah. Sure. In response to Matt, I think at this time, we just want to bring up that report so anybody that's in negotiations can see that that committee, the summer report, so to speak, I can't remember the, the official name, the cost, of the cost of education study actually addressed that. And we basically addressed the two as a committee. That, uh, we brought forward that information saying that we would highly recommend um, some adjustments in both areas on that to take into consideration. I know because you are in negotiations, you cannot speak, but I think at this point of sharing, um, the point of gathering here is to sort of hear from us because I think we're a good sounding board and uh, we just wanted to share that information with you. Thank you. I think the cost of education study, if I'm correct, was the summer of 2019 before okay. COVID hit. It was it might even been the summer of the 18, but it was it was either 18 or 19 with that summer 18. So, so if you have to go back, I'm I'm sure we have a copy in the. I think it's on your website. It is. Yeah. It yes. is. Okay. Yep. To follow up so, on that, I. Uh, sorry. Did, go ahead, Bill. One. Did, did, did first have we captured that as an issue? Yeah. 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 So let me see if I can summarize because again. The the um, the audio here isn't isn't great, but I, I think I caught most of the conversation. Um, and essentially, I think it's basically why are we looking at salaries because we have this this flush um, benefits package. Is that essentially what the conversation is? No, the, the conversation is we would like you to look at salaries and perhaps adjust the benefits accordingly and um also if some of those things have to be grandfathered we we could support that but to start down a road that would be beneficial to the school system in attracting qualified people to work for you so but, but can i just so here's in the uh, you know the school board makes these final decisions but once you get a look at the the budget what we spend on support staff, and I don't, um, won't be any more than what we've spent on the support staff in the past. Um, so there'll be no additional cost there. I do philosophically have a problem with the it with our probably our our um, uh, most needy population somehow not getting the same benefits that other people um, in the school district get. I get the financial piece. And I think once you see 
the budget, you'll see that we've, there's no additional spending there. Um, uh, but it, I, I would not be advocating for um, a, a reduction in people's benefits. I, I, you know, I think some of these people, are, you know, they, they work awfully hard for us. Um, some of them have really difficult jobs. I just talked to a woman the other day who's a one-on-one -on -one aide with our um, with uh, with one of our most challenging students, and you know, had had to go to the nurse and, and wrap up her hand because the the student had thrown something at her. Um, so, so I just want to be clear where I stand on that. Um, I, I'm the 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 financial piece. I, I hear what you're saying, and I and I think that as we look at the cost of our support staff, um, we have to rein that in a bit. Um, but it wouldn't be through benefits. Uh, do you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, Steve, do you want to go ahead? Um, I, I think that we agree that we don't want to jeopardize the benefit packages in a way that they do not have <clears throat> benefits. But we also found that other school districts have implemented, um, I guess, buyouts that would initially help them if they had a spouse to go to the spouse's insurance and, and help them there. And, uh, and they came out ahead, basically. And, um, but we don't wanna, um, we're not saying not to give them access to benefits, but there are other things that might be implemented that would help reduce that. Steve? Yeah, Phil, a lot of the, you were there for that discussion. I think it was a rather lengthy uh, summer, um, but there were several elements to it. One was to, to get better qualified, motivated, whatever the case may be, uh, support staff, uh, bring the benefit package more in line with what exists statewide. But the other piece of it, uh, which uh, there, was, there was a fair amount of foot dragging, uh, not from the superintendent, but from some of uh, the staff in terms of getting information, uh, you know, it, you know, how many times are we hearing these things about, well, you know, that's HIPAA protected as well. It's hard to have an open and productive discussion if you're trying to dodge the HIPAA bullets all the time. And I'm not sure if those bullets exist to that degree. But some of the, we talked about some of the other stuff that has happened in, in private industry out of necessity uh, that your businesses are a little bit all around the country that wouldn't exist today if they hadn't been open to new and different ideas. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, fairly common um, uh, approaches that are used today on larger deductibles is, is to have the employer assume some liability. Uh, so on and on the qualified plans today, which have just been revised, you know, for next year, it came out within the last month. On an individual, you would have a deductible of. I believe it's $6,500 or $6,900 and a family plan would have double that deductible. Well, to mitigate that $65 or $6,900 figure, which might seem onerous or, or whatever, you, you can, as an employer, implement a, uh, a structure to that and you can model, do it several different ways with a donut, without a donut, but kind of a, a typical thing would be was that the employer would pick up the first $3,000 of the deductible. Uh, the employee would pick up the second $2,000 of the deductible, and then the employer would pick up the balance of the deductible so that the uh, employee, <laughs> in the worst case scenario, would be responsible for $2,000. And most employees, truthfully, never get out of the first $3,000 deductible, so it never kicks in on them at all. Uh, but you know that requires some openness, uh, which in, in in the school industry, but truthfully in the town industry, you know, we you know we've also talked to them about that. You know they're not particularly open to that. They they like to have that absolute certainty. Well, I can tell you that there's many an employer in town, a little bit, who's 
I've done that this other way and it's saved money and does not have any negative impact on the employee. So we're not talking about eliminating benefits of people who, who need them, but we're trying to look at it in a way that you can be more productive, uh, proactive, if you would, and be able to you know, raise that entry level hiring you know, from $11 to $15 or $20, whatever the case may be, and reshift the balance, which would make you, you know, you're a better, in a better position to recruit employees. So that that was the, the sense of it. And like I say, it was the number one recommendation that came out of that. It was timely because that fall we were going into negotiations, and out of negotiations, I don't know how hard it was pushed, but I just know that the final answer was there was nothing. I wasn't around for that. But I can say that I do believe that there, there's some sentiment out in the town that the school employees have some of the best health care coverage for health care is probably the highest cost of the benefits, right? I mean, as far as the benefits go, it's either going to be the pension fund or the health insurance, correct? Yeah, that's what I yeah, I mean it's a it's a question. I didn't know if you were. It's an assumption that posed as a question. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, I didn't know if you were making that statement or. The the correct at the end was my uh, question yeah. turning into a question. Anyway, the reduction or increasing the cost bear borne by the employee is somewhat of a reality for almost every other employee, especially in the private sector. And I think that's kind of what Steve was alluding to. So I'm not suggesting that we cut people's benefits, but just like everyone else out there, uh, there's nothing wrong with having them bear more of the cost. Like my co-pays have gone up 100% over the last three years from $25 to $50. So I, I'm not sure if, if all of this is anecdotal to me because I don't know any of the information, but I do believe that you know, I have heard some people say in the town that, you know, oh, well, the school has the best benefits out there, so they shouldn't complain. So if that's the town sentiment, then a way to help um, mitigate some of that concern and help push through some of your other um, ideas is to do the rebalancing that's been. Um, suggested and also brought up again here tonight. That's all. John? Yeah, what is the what is the percentage of premiums paid by teachers right now? 15%. That is 15? She just said 15%. Yeah. That isn't totally that that isn't Go ahead, Steve. You know, we do remember. Well, it's 15 percent, Greg, unless you accept the driver plan that there's no registration by the employee, correct? They, yeah. they can take the um, 8,000. There's three plans. The top plan is a $4,000 deductible with a $2,000 HRA, which they pay 15 percent on. The second plan is a $4,000 deductible, which they don't get any HRA for. And that one, I think, is comes about 5%. They pay about 5%. And then there's the orange plan that is an $8,000 deductible, which they don't have to pay anything for. So I think when we did the calculation for like how many are in each plan, I think there were very few at the top level. Most of them were probably in the second plan you mentioned. Um, I don't know. I do know, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I do have people in the orange. Those would be people that tend not to medical insurance some of this report is kind of coming back to me sorry i mean the orange we have to have you know we have to have something that meets um, our federal requirements on health insurance that's affordable um, because if you have low-paying employees 
we have to offer some type of insurance that's affordable when we get fined. So, so some of this stuff is coming back to me. It's been, it's been a few years since I've even read the report. Um, uh, we, we, when we looked at it, and we looked at the information and what our deductibles were, um, what the employees pay, what our plan was, who we went with, it came in so much seriously stellar than some of the other uh, school districts that we were comparing, the other seven that were similar in size and structure. It was better. However, someone asked, then why, when we compared the budgets from one school district to another school district, why are we paying more? Why in our, the operating budget, why is it more if we have better plans? And the point came out was it was the support staff that we offer the same as the, the professional staff. And I'm not saying yes, no, or indifferent. I'm just sharing what we found out. Mm -hmm. And it, it came to almost $600,000 difference compared to other school districts. And, and then we started like, okay, so what are they doing with the support staff in other districts? And a lot of them had offered tremendous buyouts, which helped them purchase insurance either through a spouse's or through somewhere else. And I think in one place, the support staff didn't receive health insurance at all. We're not suggesting that, but we're saying that somewhere, that is where the big gap or the big thing was with, with the support staff, the big change, the big cost um, for this school district over other school districts. So, I think we I think we've captured that as a as a priority of, of the budget committees for us to look at. Do you have John something? Do you have something question. else? Oh, go ahead, sir. Please. Yeah. Well, well, it's it's just it's a nuance to this whole discussion. But uh, the other the other thing I'd mention is uh, I think participation somehow by by the teachers and the sports staff in their <coughs> to a level that's um, that they feel not punish but to feel helps them also control costs for everybody so it's important not to have the premium solo to them that they uh, don't feel a responsibility to control uh, medical services when they really don't need them so I, I know when when i was in business we really focused on that uh, we had a goal of uh, our employees take 30 percent we never made it we were at 20 but it's still significantly more than what uh, most teacher groups pay so i'll just point that out um and you had said i have another question you had said in the presentation that there that there is the budget does not reflect any cost for furniture and ongoing, you know, um, durable equipment kind of stuff. Um, is there a reason <laughs> that it's not part of the budget? It seems like some having some kind of rotation of furniture would be somewhat just part of operating a school. Yeah, well, it, it certainly could be part of the budget. And if that's the feedback, we'd, we, we could take a look at it. Right now, the budget that, that we're looking at is a, a about a couple hundred thousand dollars less than it is um, this year. And that's because of some of those pieces that we've pulled out of the budget. Um, it's so, but again, I mean, we, 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 could, we could add that back in. I would say my feedback is put it back in because it's part of running a school. It's like, well, it's all good, except if we have to feed the students, it'll be your, they need a place to sit down if they're going to come to school. So they need the furniture. Bill, Bill, this is Greg. Can I just clarify on, on that? When you mentioned that that was a potential Warren article for, for, for furniture, is that because it's a, 
if you're looking to do a larger purchase of furniture district district wide than you normally would in your normal routine budget annually i would imagine if we have a broken desk and we have to replace it that's part of our operating budget which i think is what you're speaking to somewhat yeah. but if we're looking at doing a like a complete refurbishment or replacement of several classrooms or, or one whole wing that that would be a well a warrant article because that's going to be an excessive purchase outside of our normal routine operating budget is that essentially what you're that, what you're looking to do that's correct okay follow-up question <clears throat> why would we have to refurbish classrooms if we're constantly you know like keeping the furniture up to date and i'm speaking loudly so we can hear yes yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's, I mean, if you look at, if you look at uh, the replacement of, um, you know, it's almost like, you know, I guess the town saying, well, you know, putting on a warrant article, a, 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 a police cru cruiser, um, mm -hmm. do you maintain the police cruiser, um, you know, every day, do you change the tires, do you make sure, you know, but, um, but that's a, that's just a philosophical piece I we could adjust um, the budget to have, you know, what, whatever it would be, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars a year, looking at you know a regular cycle of replacement. So uh, you know, I, I, I I'm not going to throw myself on a sword over over this decision, but um, so we can re-embed that into into our budget. But um, it, you know, it's 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 just. Uh, just needs to happen sometimes okay right, right. like even if you Is looked it, at like a 15 year rotation <clears throat> you know you'd still have to have a couple classrooms in your budget every year and that's what you I know what i mean and that's based why, on that, that, how is that not already done right and why that, isn't there a capital that, reserve account to take care of that there's a warrant article that i mean like, there is you know what i mean i would recommend the the that more than okay we need to refurbish five classrooms so we want to spend five you know one hundred fifty thousand dollars on furniture say create a fund for it and draw from that and hopefully it gets funded every right. year or whatnot and it, it's extremely hard right now it's like so hard to buy things right now yeah, everything is that. so yeah. inflated yeah. you know it's like you don't want to do anything at large volumes right now because everything is so expensive, you know, so, you know, it, it's tough. It, it, it's a tough decision to make. Like, how much do you do? How much do you actually budget for? Or do you set it aside for a future purchase when you have the money available, you know? It's one day different than a police cruiser. $25,000 a year goes into an account. That's 50000 each year for the police right. um so but can you find out how much is in the budget currently for such items i mean do you have anything in the budget i think we're still kind of flip-flopping whether or not we have something in the budget or we don't have anything uh, in the budget that was the question i had right here's, so can you find out? here's my suggestion is is you know tonight is to kind of capture the questions and, and so the question around furniture is you know, it's a good one. Let's come back. We'll take a look at it. And um, I think what I hear from at least a couple of the budget committee members is, is you know, embedded in, in your budget. So every every year you have a, you know, substantial amount of money to, to do replacements. That makes sense. I get it. So, so clarified in my mind is, is, is it semantics and the word refurbishing is used when it really isn't refurbishing as much as it is an ongoing replacement. But I mean, there's some stuff that gets repaired, you know, some things that can be repaired, but you truly need to be on a rotation. You need to be on a rotation or you will be in a position where you do need to spend a large amount of money at one time. Right. Just like your computers, <clears throat> you know, you have to be on um, like our facility um, list where we do so many classrooms a year. Question here, I the answer is, uh, how old is, is your Current furniture and, and, and what furnishings you or what classrooms you would you propose to replace the oldest? I'm assuming one that's most of these, but how old is that furniture? And it 
you can right. get back to that. Right. But I mean, that's something that you know, <coughs> I want to know. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can I ask a question on a different topic now? Sure. Okay. So for the state adequacy aid, I believe it's a biennium number. And this year it came in $477,000 more than what we were told. I think the, the sequence is that sometimes in October or November, the state tells alerts to school districts approximately how much they're going to get. And then we vote in March, and then the governor makes his budget, and then we, we find out the real truth of mm -hmm. what you're really going I'll to get. get. We'll have our estimate within the next two weeks. So, that our budget but this is not a biennium. Yeah, this 477 was in addition to it was was it a, a formula that they based that on so if it, if it's a formula is this the first year of the formula because it usually goes for two years so will we be receiving the same amount we'll find out in two weeks what our amount will be it will be based on um, our free and reduced number as of october 1st and our adm this past, this Those last year, they changed the ruling so that we could use our 2019 numbers instead of 2020 because of COVID. But the formula will still be the same. So that's what I'm trying to establish. Is it the formula? Was this the first year of a new formula? Or is, are they now creating a different formula? The formula itself didn't change. They allowed us to use our 2019 number. Uh -huh. But now our numbers that are coming out in the next two weeks will be based on our 2021 numbers as of October 1st. But the base formula will be the same. Right, it has that. We just got to go back and use our 2019 enrollment and free and reduced numbers. I was just, but did that, our input, did that influence the 477,000 just on the community lunch numbers? And, and ABM. Yeah. Diane, it's, it's, I, I want to make sure I understand Diane's question. It's about. Yeah, um, she, she was, oh, sorry, go ahead. She was just asking about the adequacy aid and what, what the amount would be based on for this upcoming fiscal year. And, and if it was going to be the same as what we just got, and I told her the numbers would be based on October 1 of this fiscal year. Yeah. Which I believe, I believe, so So the problem, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you probably remember, but let me just go over it again. The problem last year was the government gave everybody free lunches. So the parents that would normally sign up for free and reduced lunch didn't. And across the country and across our state, there's a significant drop in, in free and reduced lunch applications. That's what we were talking about when we were trying to build the budget because of for last year, because we were having false numbers. We had $477,000 less than what we, we could have anticipated getting because of that. The state, by law, have to follow their own formula. So it wasn't until after the fact that they actually went back to the previous year's numbers. And that's why we received the $477,000 that the state believed that the school, Littleton school system needs to operate was sent back to us. Um, and so this coming year, I think our numbers are back up near the 2019 numbers. So I don't see a significant change um, in what we can anticipate. Would you agree with that, Patty? Yes. Bill, I was just basically getting, there were three things that influence the adequacy A. One is the ADM. Another one is the uh, free and reduced lunch. And the third part, new formula. So I was just trying to establish which year of the biennium are we in on the formula because they every two years they switch they change the state adequacy aid formula 
Do you know which year are, are they, is it gonna be a new formula for next year? I mean- I haven't heard anything about a new formula. Okay. No, I, I have the state document okay. in front of us, the, the calculation for FY 21 and 22 is the same. So I believe that would make next year the second year. At 20, so it'd be the same for 22, 23. 23. Right. So we are. Uh, quick question. Um, on the slides, you said that level funding, because of a 5% inflation rate, level funding is essentially equivalent to a cut of $850,000 in um, spending, uh, buying power, correct? So that's saying that 5% of the budget, $850,000 represents 5% of the budget. Correct. Right. Seventeen million dollar budget would be eight hundred fifty thousand. Yep. Okay. Good. Later in the slide, I think it was on the last one in the presentation, it said we wanted to um, retain five percent of the budget for. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it, it, am I remembering this the slide correctly? It's essentially so it's saying that we want to retain eight hundred fifty thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. dollars. Yeah, that's the retention. Um, we currently, um, under uh, RSA 198.5, we can numbers. retain okay. two and a half percent of our net assessment, local assessment. So it's about 250,000. Um, under the RSA currently that the voters approved indefinitely until it's voted out is for emergencies and over expenditures. And if not used for that, it's used as an additional revenue source to reduce taxes every year. From what I can tell, in the past few years, it has not been used. It's been used to reduce taxes. The RSA changed um, two years ago that um, you can retain up to 5%. And under the new ruling, the 5%, the board has to have a hearing if they use the money. The money doesn't have to be under emergency situations. The 5% can be used for unanticipated expenses. So like Dr. Hart was saying, our budget is gonna be a little more lean than it has been. And in case there are some unanticipated expenses that come up, um, that 5% is up to, it doesn't have to be, the board can decide at um, year end um, that if they choose to make, if there's a goal to return 500,000 and there's 700,000, you know what I mean? So it's yep. up to 5%. Um, they'll retain what they choose to retain. But whatever we do use, the difference between the two RSAs is uh, this one, we want to have a new article this year. Well, if the board chooses to have an article for that new RSA, but you have to have a hearing and it has to be um, reported in our audit report, detailed what the 5%, what those monies would be. Right now that two and a half percent doesn't have to be reported um, and we don't have to have a hearing. Okay. They can just use it for emergency pur purchases or over expenditures. Um, if it's, uh, but the 5% has a little more controls to it, I think. Um, and the board would have to have a hearing. Right, right. But the new rule is that we can retain up to five percent, and we just have to have a public hearing in a town. What we might do before. I think they got rid of the, the DOE part of that. Yeah, they did. Uh, the, just, just recently. recently. Yes. Well. From sitting through the presentation, I'm not sure if you're you're intending on showing this presentation to the voters or whatnot. But I saw five percent is eight fifty. Five percent retain five percent oh, of the earnings. Yeah, it's, the, yeah, the it's only up the, we're only allowed um, to keep the local. You may want to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll make sure that it it says. Um, I think this year's um, retention is two hundred sixty five thousand. I believe is what um, what the what I retained was 265. It's only a <laughs> local assessment. What we what is right. um, collected from the town. No, I, I got that as soon okay. as you said it's a different. I, I, it's a different top line, and you're taking yeah. percentage off of that. 
But I didn't get that from we'll the slides. We'll make sure it says 5% so of local clarify, assessment. Retention of local assessment. Make sure, it's, make sure it's clear for the community. Yeah. 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 Um, Thank you for pointing that out. You say the, um, there's technology um, expenditures being planned. Um, I'm just curious what the technology expenditures are. And again, we don't have, you don't have to tell me now, but um, you may want to be ready with that information. Um, but some of those, you know, hey, we're going to spend money here. And, you know, mm -hmm. I've remembered the technology one. Others may clue in on some of those. So if you're ready with those numbers would be my feedback. So, so just for the process, we have two more meetings scheduled with you. And I'm assuming during those two meetings, you'll have your budget basically planned out a little bit more in detail. And we will be reviewing that. So you will be seeing some of that information there. Is that that's the way yeah, just like last year is the first time the board's hearing you did this as well. Yeah. So that was the same as it was last year. So then it, I think Bill, Dr. Hart's plan is to follow his same roadmap he did last year, which I thought worked well. Um, so yeah, so everything that you're hearing tonight is the first time the board is hearing okay. it as well. I'm new. So. <laughs> the, the ESSER funds, can you explain it um, and how much were or are or will be the ESSER funds? And it can be used on facilities, technology, and teaching and learning. So can someone explain a little bit more about the ESSER funds? Okay. Could someone repeat that question? Dr. Hart, um, the uh, budget committee is looking for a little deeper of an explanation on the ESSER funds, what, what type of things we can use it on for facilities, for technology, for teaching and learning kind of laying out a little bit more detail is what the ESSER funds can be used for. And what are they and, and how much? And how much they are. What do we have or what do we predict to have? Yeah. So what they can be used for is, I mean, in a broad definition is anything that's related to COVID. So um, in, in our facilities, we can do some things like we, we can look at some of our roofs, but and Patty could do a better job of this than I can, but but there has to be air exchange type of um, uh, units that are on the roofing for them to consider that uh, you know a COVID related piece. So there's um, you know there's there's other pieces you know I, I think Patty and correct me if I'm wrong if if um, you know say say carpeting or or we have uh, you know, air exchange units in uh, elementary schools. And so anything that would help mitigate the problem of an airborne um, uh, disease could be, could be used. Um, you can also have a bigger construction project. There's a, there's a far more complicated um, process for that, but but that also can happen. The technology, what we're looking at with technology is, is as an example, and, and we don't know, we're, we're looking into this, but we think that this is gonna be able to work. So we have um, a lease for Promethean boards that we um, purchased and installed last year. <clears throat> and we had a multi-year lease. We believe that we'll be able to pay off that lease using um, uh, these ESSER funds. We also have software that is can be multi-year um, agreements with software. We are, we have uh, Chromebooks and and laptops that that um, we can pay off and pay for a multi-year uh, process. So so if we get that passed, which it, you know we're fairly certain that that will be able to be passed. That's that's a fair amount of money that that you can not you you don't have to um, budget for for the next several years. Was that helpful? It is, but how much? <laughs> three million. It's, it's three million and change. Yeah. I'm trying to find the exact number from the last meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was the 
I'm trying to find the minutes, but the minutes are off in my access sheet. I will ask you to go to three, three and change. Because we came in two pieces, so we, we improved up to the new total, yes. which is second value that came in late Friday that day, that week, I think. Is it so how much again? They're looking to try to get the exact amount. That would be a, a motion. So and it's over three million dollars. Yes. Well, received in one year or all three years. Or it's what? it's a total amount. We have to spend it by September of two thousand twenty-four. So I had a, I had a question. I think you've answered it, but I just want to clarify. Um, so Dr. Hart, you mentioned facilities and technology. And then the third point you mentioned was teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So what I what I took from all that was it's it's purchase of a physical asset or a, let's call it a software asset perhaps. Um, so the teaching and learning is uh, it's not for salaries or for additional positions or anything like that. It's something. It's a one time purchase. Is that is that a fair comment? Well, it, it, it's a it's a combination of, of things. Um, so what we're trying to avoid doing is putting in positions that we we can't sustain over time. So so we 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 don't have that in a, the budget um, you're going to be looking at. We are looking at um, uh, what's called the teacher residency program, which um, you know. A lot of our expense comes through special education and we're, we're trying to partner and it looks like we're gonna be able to um, partner with Plymouth State in a teacher residency program, which gets teachers that are going through their master's program um, to come and have an intensive time with, with us. So um, what that would mean is they would basically be in the buildings four days um, out of the week and helping with the, you know students that have um, uh, academic challenges. So, so that's a fairly significant part of that teaching and learning piece. Um, now there's, there's, there's other pieces of that <coughs> which will allow us to rethink how we use other stuff. Um, so I think just like operations and like technology, we're trying to build a system to, to use these funds to leverage um, ongoing and embedded budget savings over time. Yeah, I was just trying to understand the parameters, that's all. So I appreciate the answer. It's 3.4. 3.4. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. And have we received any of that yet? Received all of it, I think. Yeah. And have you spent any of it? it uh, I don't know on that question. I know that when we voted to accept the final balance at the last meeting, we also asked the policy committee of the board to evaluate existing policies to make sure that there was a clear um, governance protocol in place so that we could evaluate expenditures from those funds so that it was something that the board had a had a voice in the public had exposure to as to how that money was spent it is pretty tightly defined i don't know okay there was a sheet from a couple of weeks ago that you had given us that outlines sort of the do's and don'ts of that funding maybe right. we can make that available to the budget committee the next mention is helpful it is it's kind of very wonky as things from the federal government tend to be there's this there's a lot of yeah. What is it? Twenty-four page policy of our guidelines that we have to follow. All the procurement requirements and everything for federal funding. But um, the ESSER funding, I will <coughs> at a minimum twenty percent of the funding has to be used for lock and learning. So um, the student, the residency program, um, will definitely go towards that twenty percent. To help in learning? loss loss of learning, loss, loss of, of learning. Yeah, students with COVID. So twenty percent of that has to be used for that. Right, like making up for loss of learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got the three point four million in a bank account. No, no, no. Federal government doesn't do that. You need to spend it first. Okay, so you haven't. It's reimbursement. We're approved for it. it. 
loss of learning. So case in point, they had a robotics team on the high school for one year, but then last year they did have robotics because that whole project, that whole program got shut down. Would revitalizing a robotics team because that was a loss of learning count towards that? What's the question about the robotics team? I, I, the, the bottom line is actually there's been funding for the robotics team and, and um, we'll be launching it again this year. I, I didn't hear the specific question, but. I just said last year they didn't have it because of COVID. So would that be a loss of learning situation that could count towards the 20% and beef that up? That's all. Oh, th I mean, yeah, uh, so yeah, the 20%, the, the, the yeah, a whole variety of different things that, that um, could be connected to, uh, you know, loss of, loss of effective learning. Um, you know, that, that wouldn't happen with this particular year because there's external funding that's gonna help with the robotics program. But um, yeah, for, for, as an example, you know, an expansion of our summer school um, was, was another um, piece that was connected to the 20%. Um, and remember the 20% is a minimum that's what they demand. Um, it, so I, I think it's important for people to understand that too. I'd like to go back to my question. What do you define as loss of learning? Bill, what is, what is the definition of loss of learning? How do you define it? Well, so you'd have, I mean, we, we do uh, ongoing embedded assessments. So if students, have lost um, a percentage of a year of learning. It's reflected in some of the assess assessments we do. There's also this, the assessment of, of just, you know, um, teachers looking at the classroom that's in front of them and the con context of the, you know, the last several years and seeing if students are coming into this particular school year and, and without the skill sets and the knowledge base that, that students had prior to that. So those are some of the pieces that we'd use to kind of assess um, where students are and what they may have lost because of COVID. Can I follow up on that, um, Bill? Um, with the assessment, um, the assessments and the timeline of the assessments, um, student testing has changed over the years. And in order for you to know where the loss of learning is and the, and how uh, you know dramatic it is, what assessment and when are those assessments given so you can get on track right away in helping the students? Yeah, uh, Diane, Craig, could you help me out with Diane's question, please? Sure. So. Um, and if I'm off target, let me know. Basically, what, you know, what are we doing now to identify those loss of learning through our assessments? Assessments have changed over the years. Um, so I guess the question is, what are we doing now for assessments to basically identify those, those and then addressing them now rather than waiting three years to address something that maybe we're able to identify now, but we failed to take action on. That Pretty much. Uh, I know with some of the results of the assessments before, it would take quite a long time before we get um, those results back. Sure. So they have software that they're instantly testing them like right now in the classroom. Like some of the software they have, they're testing them regularly. Right. Like the kids don't even realize they're like being tested. And then right. is that consolidated? Is someone looking at that? Yes, their teams are. The teams, the teams are. are. Yes. Sorry, I was trying to catch on. Sorry, Greg. I didn't. That's right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, please. please. Yes, <laughs> the teams get together regularly and they're assessing their grade level, their curriculum. And then to have the ESSER funds come into play. And you're saying that you're looking at policy so somewhere the board is involved in the decision of those ESSER funds to help with the learning 
So that information would then be addressed to either the principal and then to the school board. Because the board has policies that govern expenditures over a certain amount, right? So we are, yes, the policy could be that to complete the review, but that that would still hold true for anything expended through the ethics program. It's just important, I think, when all of a sudden, because of this COVID largesse from the federal government, we find ourselves with the opportunity to spend this money. I think there needs to be proper oversight, right? And that the board and the town need to have transparent exposure when we can spend dollars. I, I agree. I was just trying to see how the funnel went. Yeah, I think it needs to be defined. That was a topic of conversation just at the last board meeting. So I think that was a big uh, area of focus and certainly something that, I, that I'm interested in. Right. And it, it is very wonky. Like, I mean, it, we were looking at the fire alarm uh, lakeway situation and the way the ESSER, uh, I guess the statutory stuff that establishes the ESSER funds is written. You can use ESSER funds to bring unused space up to code because that will help spread out the kids and could conceivably reduce transmission of communicable diseases in a future pandemic. But since the, the classrooms are currently in use and not condemned, the money can't be used to upgrade the system because it's not expanding our space and footprint. So it gets very particular. And I think everything needs to be evaluated on a case by case basis is, is part of the challenge. So without being, uh, without being too cynical, who, who would make a judgment when it's a, uh, a question? Is every expenditure have to, is it essentially grant based? Does it have to be? Or is it checked after the fact? How does that work? What, what do you mean? Like, and do we spend $200,000 thinking it would be covered by ESSER funds and it turns out it's not? Well, yeah. Well, first of all, it goes, the whole has to go through grant approval process. So it's approved before it's spent. It gets Absolutely. spent and then you get the money. The activity has to be created and approved by DOE before anything can happen. With the ESSER funds. With ESSER funds. So it's it's a oh. it's it's a Department of Education committee somehow that's yeah, they approve it adjudicating this. Yeah. Yeah. And believe me, it's not easy. I mean it's not easy. Like you can't just simply write a couple sentences and think your activity is gonna get approved. So so just I'm a facilities guy. I've worked at the hospital plant. This ESSER funding was a little bit is big. For it's a big opportunity for the school to not only improve their infrastructure, i.e., air handling systems and so software that is required to run the air handling system, and, and all to prevent pathogens, infectious pathogens from. It's spread over over time over the years. This has been neglected, um, and, and not purposely. Don't get me wrong on that, but it's it's been neglected. <coughs> not only in Littleton, but nationwide. Now you see what's happening. Whenever you say it's not addressed, not identified. It, it has been not identified, not addressed. Um, we have an opportunity now, and it's, it's for more than $3 million. Um, I, from what I've read, um, I don't want to correct anybody here, but I think it's well over about $5 million that we'll eventually be able to get. Uh, so, so what the facilities group has done is to kind of put together, um, I know, address Lakeway, the high school, and to see how we can improve on those infrastructure. If we have if we have a list, and it's it's not even near near to three million. And, and so you know when I I get disturbed when I kind of hear how people are going to um, beat this thing to death to decide whether you're going to spend the money on something that is required. That isn't going to affect the tax base in Littleton whatsoever. Um, 
and, and and we're only going to benefit by it in the future because we have currently 18 year old air handling systems here at the high school that haven't been addressed so what's going to happen in another two or three years this guy is going to come over to us or to these guys and they're going to say we need to replace the air handlers and everybody here is going to say why the heck didn't we do it when we had five million bucks to do it on the government stuff so i, I totally agree with you but uh, but the other night listening to some of the comments um it it was difficult i think hands down anyone would say yes in this facility no one would ever question oh, I agree. no one would ever question absolutely that you, you have Lakeway. I, all I hear to hear is let's not spend another dime at Lakeway. But you have you have some infrastructure inadequacies there in the individual classroom through an air quality study that was just done by by these guys that says you need to do better on your air standards. So so that's the kind of stuff that this ESSER money is going to allow us to do is to is to make it safer. For the people that are in that school, I mean, whether we leave, leave there or not, it's it's a small small price to pay for the safety of everybody in there. Well, well I, I think you hit it on the nail, though. You know, these are funds outside of Absolutely. tax base, and I mean, that really needs to promote it. What you just said. So last year, Henry, I'm I'm going to get on a bandwagon here for two seconds. Last year, we had brought forward the idea of having a, you know, getting a, like a project manager to kind of go through all of the information because there's turnover and there's how many years have we studied this and right. to bring all that information together. And we, I was always thinking of George Broder as how he helped us. And what you just said was really in the same vein as George, you are able to communicate it to us in a way that people understand. And so uh, kudos, I hope you continue to do that. Well, I have to tell you, I I left the hospital, managed that for years, the, the, the facility as far as the operation. I see an opportunity here to help these folks. These folks volunteer their time. Um, what I would like to provide is sustainability to, to a fellow like this, to Dale, because in three years' time, this person here may not be here. Those folks may not be here. I want to be here to, to continue to help with the, with, the, with the process. That was the point of last year. And, and although the Warren article failed, I think they, you also were appointed to the, the building committee. Yeah. And, and I'll make a building facilities, 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 facilities committee. And so that that is the thing that I was trying to, to get. Yeah. So, um, but like you explained, our talking points that every one of these people should be able to have, it, it bears nothing on the tax base. It is, there are things that we need to do right now. Uh, it's an 18 year old, or, you know, 18 year old facility. Is it 18 already? I can't believe it. But anyways, that these air exchange handlers are 18 years old and we need to do something. Those are the talking points that yeah. everyone needs to I, have. I don't, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that because like the other night, the fire alarm system at like, okay. We did, we did a lousy job of not doing our homework there, I, I have to admit, because of the fact that there may be a, there may be a way to improve the existing fire alarm system to at least get us through till, till we decide what the heck we're doing with Lakewood, okay? But to, to have, just to have that kind of animosity that was delivered on well, I did X, Y, and Z to a certain fire alarm system, and it's fine. It, it, it's not apples to apples, and, and I get hot for it over that kind of stuff. So. And just for everybody's benefit, too, what Henry's referencing is the, the get report. <coughs> the 
made public, I think, at a board meeting at the beginning of October, that in total chronicles about 1.4 million in um, recommendations for uh, enhancements, replacements, adjustments at Lakeway and here. And I think there's already been at the beginning of an assessment of what of those proposed expenditures could be covered through extra funds because a lot of the air handling stuff, the air quality stuff, is very clearly in line with the spirit of the problem was a culprit on the fire alarm system at Lakeway. I came out of the Navy Marine business. Yep. Some of the ships that I dealt with carried 35,000 tons of high explosive. They were 35, 40 years old. We repaired the fire alarm system routinely. And we met all of the requirements we had for safety. That was the point of my question. Have we looked at this thing? And somebody who is competent but when an unbiased manner can look at it and come back and report that this the thing can be supported for another five years, can be supported for another six months, or we can't support it. I don't disagree with you. And and, and when we, we had our discussion two weeks ago, we were not prepared to answer the question. And 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 I and I and I still can't answer the question, but Dale and I had a discussion today about it, and um, we are going to look into it so that we can respond more intelligently to, to the folks who ask the question in the duty, because we need to. Uh, we need to. My feeling is we need to restore faith in whenever we talk to the people in the community and say we we need we need to spend this because we need to. Not because we feel like, and um, that's that's my goal. And, uh, I think the other thing that was unclear from the, the meeting that we had a week or two ago, or how long ago it was now, was that what we were asking the community was whether or not the community wanted us to set this side of money into our funds, our our capital funds to spend on items such as A, B, C, and D, which we were then presented. Um, and I think, I think, I personally think that what we failed to do was kind of clarify that we weren't trying to bring all these individual items, that these were the definitive things, these were the definitive prices, and this is what we were going to do with it. These were safety items that we were, that were brought to us as recommendations that we felt needed to be addressed. We had money to spend it on, and what we were asking the town, the town was whether or not we had permission to put that into a fund and then explore and get the get you know true numbers. And the only thing we really had to go on was the getting figure of $150,000. And we could have taken longer and come with much more detail on that, but it would have put off the tax bill. We were trying to be cognizant of that, that it typically would get our tax bill in November. And if we delayed it, the more we delayed it, the more we delayed getting tax bills out to the community. Um, so I think that truthfully, I think we failed to kind of make that more clear than we did. So I think people that were in that room that voted were voting on approving those five items that we listed, not on putting the funds aside for us to use on safety items. And here are some possible items we may spend them on. Yeah, hindsight, I wouldn't have brought up the five items at all. I said, we have this extra money. We'd like to put it aside for a safety capital reserve fund. Do you approve or not? So in hindsight, somebody in that meeting would have stood up and said, well, what are you going to spend it on? Yeah, yeah. It would have happened. Yeah. Especially after so. the lady blasted torpedo everybody with the Daisy Bron form of Daisy Bronze. And, and, and that just is bad. Well, and I don't want to rehash last Monday, of course. I think we conceded not failing to double the other side of that equation. But uh, to talk to what Henry's saying a little bit, just to give us something different perspective. And as Greg said, this is the first time we're hearing any of this. And for me, this is the first, first time because this is my first <clears throat> kind of budget process as a board member. My concern as a as a taxpayer and as a board member is that I, I don't want the windfall that we're getting from the feds to mask the fact that we already have a really <clears throat> big budget. 
right? So yes, do I think we should spend the money and spend it up? Yeah, of course we should. The federal government should have money, we should spend it, right? Um, as much as that drives my gears to the taxpayer. But I don't want that to cover over sins and to for us to not be prudential going forward. Because the reality is we shouldn't constantly be in a position where we have all of this stuff unaccounted for with a $17 million budget. I think the reality is this district gets plenty of money. The district has really, really large administrative overhead costs. That needs to be rationalized. The district has really, really high health care. That needs to be rationalized. And so I do think we should spend the money, but I think as we work through these next several budget cycles, I'll be a part of three of them so long as I'm alive. And perhaps my wife would prefer that I not be. But I do think we have to say, okay, Let's take this opportunity to spend this money, but how do we look at the budget through the lens of what's the post-COVID impact of the current spending levels, less ESSER funds, and how do we make sure we're not in this situation on a go-forward basis where this stuff can be paid for because we do have enough money allocated. Because I think the reality is from the town's perspective, right or wrong, now I'll find out as I go through this process, the district has plenty of money. It isn't necessarily the most efficient at spending it. That's why we're doing another uh, operational audit that was voted on at the, at, the, at the last town meeting that's underway. That's why we're doing a, a, a use of facility study that's just been concluded that we're waiting to get a report on. So I think there's opportunity for us to, yes, spend this money, do the PR campaign that Henry's saying, and make it clear that, like, yeah, of course we spend this money because it's not going to impact anybody, but it will impact the taxpayers if we keep not accounting for the other issues that we have, because we'll always be in a position of needing to add foreign articles on top of the budget that is already a pretty healthy budget. So just a, a different perspective from, from my side. Now, is, there, is there one more item that's potentially confusing voters? That is the desire to you know, have out there in the public realm the idea of three or four school sites for replacing Aging yeah, some people could be not leaving. Sorry, <laughs> boy, I can't believe I did that. But anyway, um, some people may be saying, "Why should we spend anything yep. on Lakeway if we're going to be building new schools?" So I think that also needs to be taken head on, especially by the school board if we're going to. We're, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to. We're having a bit of failure. Start. Henry's actually on that committee. There's a Lakeway committee. Uh, myself and Erica, Bill, and him, I don't the name, uh, Crystal, Henry, Dale. Uh, and right now, we're, we've been trying to get town members to be involved, and everybody just told me no. Yeah, I, to be but, honest, I actually felt bad that you lost that vote, and I wasn't here, so I, you know, I, I'm part of the problem, I guess. Right? <laughs> but essentially, the scope of the committee's work, it, as it hopefully takes flight, is to not just evaluate new construction, right? But to evaluate new construction, renovation, and consolidation, which is why the use of space study is so important for us to look at. And I think that work and that evaluation, especially use of space, informs these discussions because that was my immediate reaction when I asked the representative from Yetton was, okay, you have a $1.4 million proposed budget, one billion of that one for is Lakeway. Does that make the most sense? Obviously, we're not going to have a new school built in, in August, right? Probably not in August of 22 or 23, right? But what makes sense? And I think those are the discussions that we need to have uh, fairly transparent. Yeah, I think there's a need for clarity. Well, yeah. So just, just uh, I'm going to play the time check guy. Uh, we're an hour and 40 minutes into this meeting. Um, what What's really important, I think, is that that we leave with a, you know, a list of concrete feedback. I don't know if, if Sheena can kind of review what she's captured so far, but if we could do that and then, and then add, make sure that we have everything that, that's important to the school board and um, to the budget committee. Um, and you know, we're not gonna solve all the issues tonight, but, it, but if we at least have them identified so we can reflect on it, we can modify, the budget and, and 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 hopefully be better in line with what the two boards' objectives are um, for when we do our first formal presentation. So, so I guess I'd turn it over to to, to Sheena if she could. Um,
kind of identify what you have so far. And if we could just have, if there's somebody, I don't know if it would be Greg, you, if you could kind of try to add or summarize or um, pieces that have been, you know, discussed today to make sure that we have that um, and we can act on it. We want some actionable um, feedback tonight. Sure. So the first thing on the list is negotiations, which, you know, are ongoing right now. And, and I think one of the things that was carved out from the negotiations is that next line, which is the cost of education study and what was evident in that study is with regards to um, the cost of benefits versus the salaries or the, or the pay rate and whether or not there's an opportunity to make some changes now uh, while we're in negotiations, which I'm not sure if it's too late to do that now or if this is something we at least need to keep uh, in front of us going forward, but is there an opportunity to save money for the district uh, through benefits, um, improving benefits, making benefits more efficient. Um, but again, I think those two things were tied together, knowing that we're in the middle of negotiations and um, not sure if that will have much impact now or if it's going to have to be something that is at the forefront of the next round. Um, but that I'm not sure. I don't know. You know, I'm trying to remember when we did our last change of health insurance, which was several years ago. Um, how that was done with the negotiation. I think if I remember from past negotiations, you have so many times that you meet mm -hmm. and you have to declare it. there is a definitive date that after that date you can't bring any new items Correct. on. So I don't know if you pass that date we or not. Yeah. A certain time frame, no more items. You, but we're not we're happen. not past that line. Okay. So so there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity. Um and so I think that also is this the third line, which is look at salaries and just benefits. That's all kind of one piece. The next item on the list was um, the discussion around um, potentially for a warrant article for furniture and what they what the uh, budget committee uh, came back with is whether or not we should be adding furniture into our regular operating budget doing some type of, of cycle. Um, what our current budget amount is, what our age of our furniture is throughout the district and how do we get that onto a cycle to keep it in the operating budget rather than doing a warrant article. Um, the other one that's on the list is technology expenditures, um, kind of defining those uh, technology expenditures. Um, and um, again, some of that would tie into ESSER versus non-ESSER. Um, and then I'm just going to go through my notes because I've got um, a little bit different there. Um, so furniture, uh, one of the thing was to be clear that we clarify the 5% versus 5% just to the community, that was a good recommendation. Um, and that was the 5% inflation impact versus the 5% of unexpended funds. Um, ESSER funding, uh, again, kind of, I think we had a good discussion about how that doesn't impact the taxpayer, but how, um, we still want to make sure that there is oversight and that we're spending it appropriately and that that is transparent to not only the board, but in turn to our community as well. Even though it doesn't have a tax impact, um, the transparency of that spending is still um, something that's needed. Um, and I think that all stems to that trust uh, topic. And then um, I think the other last thing was really the clarifying what our plans are for Lakeway, whether in both the short term and long term. There's there are things that we have to do because we're in the building. There's things that we can't just ignore because our hope is to be out in 10 years or in five years because I know they started looking this, at this back in the 70s because my father-in-law kept in his briefcase a study of the property, the, the Greenwood property, the Greenwood property that was done back in the mid 70s. So this hasn't, this isn't a new project, but if we stopped fixing Lakeway in the 70s because we were planning to be in the Greenwood property or somewhere else in town, 
where would we be today? So there's an ongoing need to spend money on that building in order to keep it safe for our, our children to be in that building for education. At the same time, we have to be cognizant of not overspending on things that are gonna prevent us from eventually making some type of change, whether it's a new building, as, as Matt said, a re, uh, you know, restructuring of that building or, re, or restructuring of the district and bringing into a different facility altogether. Um, so I don't know, did I touch all the points that we kind of talked about or did I miss any? No, I think Good you job. touched it. Um, just on the facilities, mm -hmm. on the facilities. Um, one of the things that we had to do um, in a prior facility renovation was really explain to the public how education had changed from the time that the bat building it could have been built. And some of the things that came up was um, girls are now playing sports. Um, I mean, we, we just, back then they didn't as much, but now we just expect it, right? So you need the facility for the, the, the female, the girl team. Special well. ed was handled yeah. completely different four years ago than it was the minute it's today. Yeah, exactly. The other thing is technology. You know, technology <laughs> changed everything and, and how many phone. plugs you need in the uh, outlets you need in the classroom. You know, it's all of those things that people just don't really think about that you have to kind of list them for them. So so I want I'm gonna throw a question back at you because this is something that we've struggled with on the board for years. How do we get this to the public? We've, we've tried to hold public sessions at Lakeway to get them to come into the physical building. We've held sessions here. We've done, you know, we've done write-ups. People have written, uh, you know, editorials. And you've been to many of the meetings. It's the same people that come every time. Just as you look at our voting, if you look at our vote every year, what percentage of our, of our uh, residents actually vote? is small so how do you how do we get i'm looking for this group for you to give us suggestions on how we can get it out there to more people because it seems like we're, we're getting it out to people but it's the same people and we're not getting it out to the people that we need to it it seems because we're, we're continuing to fail and i know some of that is the messaging and some of that is how it's presented but how would i i'm looking for I think all of us might be looking for other ideas as to how to get this out to our community. Social media. Yeah. I like, I, I, yeah, I, I check Facebook. Yeah. I don't go to the SAU site. And the, even when my, I had three kids in the system, I didn't go to the website for the school, but Instagram. I check, I check social media. So yeah. And, and I think, we, I think we've done some of that. I don't know how well we've done it, but I mean, I think there has been some attempt to do that as well. So you think, did you see all weeks? of our recent postings then? So you saw all of our recent postings? No, no one was sharing with uh, sharing the posts. And I'm not, uh, you know, I didn't, I'm not connected to the school board or whatever, the school board's Facebook or the SAU's Facebook or anything like that. So you have that problem to get over in the first place. But then if there's information that, of people seem deem worth sharing. You have to make it pretty inflammatory, I guess, so people share it one way or the other and it gets people talking. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you can't just go, well, this is what we're thinking. It's like, we're going to spend this money or we're not going to do this. And then people start getting angry one way or the other and share, do you believe this? Na, 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 na. And next thing you know, there's a lot of people that just know about it. I'm not sure inflaming things would be the right approach. Yeah. However, yeah. I, I think I think finding other ways to inform. I think Facebook may be one answer. I hate <clears throat> Facebook and I won't use it. Yeah. So there's other people like me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's multiple multiple pathways. But I also think that um, you you the school system and you as leaders and the school board and Dr. Hart. I think you actually need to select directions and go after them a little bit, but you've got to be able to explain why this is the direction we're doing. And then I would I would help you get public participation of those things somehow 
and, and maybe it's a combination of what you say, but other things as well. Because, for instance, here's an example. Last year, if, if you were at our deliberative session, a community member got up and said this. They turned, they talked down that that position for a, uh, uh, I, I can't remember what we called it, project, project, manager. project manager. And they said, no, we, we don't need that. There's so many experts in our community that would be willing to volunteer their time. Matt and Erica have reached out to community members and and Henry and, Dale. And, and, and and the answer back is no, we don't have time or no, we're not interested. So that, that's disappointing. It's right. highly disappointing. I think we actually we all pushed for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You were very supportive of that position. But to have somebody come up and say, Oh, you don't need this, there's countless people in the community to help out. So it fails. Then we go to do exactly what they tell us to do, which was call on our community members, and the doors are shut in our face. I hate to say this, but somebody with a good marketing background might be might be important to tap into here. It's not me. I'm not a marketer. It's not normal. I think Henry's a marketer here. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think I think we did everything that you did, or you you are doing everything we did. Okay. Uh, I, I remember like writing guest editorials. I had four guest editorials uh, and I I reserved a spot in the paper. I called them up two months in advance and said, I want these four days because we're gonna have a, a guest editorial. I remember working on them until midnight and sending them off to Kim DeLuz so she could fine tune it. And so you're doing that to it, but you, but what is missing is like I have to say last year's Warren article, going to John uh, John's point, was a little bit too. We'll do it this way or we'll do it that way, and it was people just kind of turned it down because they didn't know which way you were going to go. So you have to find a direction. You got to have what you're doing, the guest editorials, the committees, all of that. I remember taking plans from one site to another site, from a bank, from one bank, down to Shaw's, down to the library, down everywhere. So people, once you got a plan, architectural renderings, that people could see it. They couldn't help but not see it because it was everywhere. And then we had, we had George. And George just had a way of, we knew he knew what he was talking about. And so when he spoke, and he spoke most of the time, when he did a lot of the presentation, people trusted the information. And it wasn't like we asked you a question and we said, we'll get back to you. Because you have a captive audience. You need to have that answer then, not later. And that's where your spokesperson comes in. And then all of you have to have cheat sheets with all of this information down there. So like when you see someone in the grocery store and they ask you a question, you know it. You've nailed it. I remember having cheat sheets. So, um, but you're, you know, it's workable. You just have to decide what you want to do. Hey, folks. Um, Great conversation, uh, and I, I appreciate the, the the summary that that Greg did. Um, I don't know if we're close to wrapping up, but I haven't been well, so I'm going to need to excuse myself if we're if we're not close to being done. But um, I appreciate everybody's feedback. I think we captured kind of the the essence of of the feedback, especially from the the, the budget committee. Um, so again, uh, the, 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 the current discussion is critically important, but um, I'm, I'm going to have to excuse myself, I think. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Good luck in your recovery. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions?